Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. My name is Marielle Voxeff, and I am the Associate of Educational Events here at Mars. I'd like to start off with one announcement today. This is actually our last lecture of the year. And um, after the holidays, we'll be starting again on January 4th at 6 o'clock. We're kicking off our new year with a very exciting speaker. His name is Ian Telfer, and he is an inspirational figure in the Canadian mining industry. He's had a hand in creating a series of mining companies that are now valued at more than $50 billion. He's the chairman, president, and chief executive officer of North American Metals Corporation, and he also serves as chairman of the World Gold Council, Gold Corp Incorporated, and Uranium One. He has more than 25 years of experience as an executive in the mining industry and the precious metals business. He's a philanthropist and has won several awards, amongst them the West Western Canada's Entrepreneur of the Year Award. So we hope to see you all there on January 4th. This is going to be a very exciting lecture. He is a great speaker. Uh, also an announcement, one quick announcement about the Entrepreneur's Toolkit workshops in January. If you submitted an application, we'll have an answer to you by the end of the week if you have been accepted. I'd like to go ahead now and introduce our speaker for this evening, David Pasika. David's executive leadership experience spans many of Canada's leading companies, including Bell Canada and most recently Liberty Utilities. Liberty Utilities is a wholly owned division of Algonquin Power, a TSX listed organization. As its president, David is focused on acquiring and managing a portfolio of regulated water, natural gas and electrical distribution companies throughout the United States. Prior to joining Liberty Utilities, David was, was engaged as an entrepreneur in residence at the Rick Center and spent two and a half years here at Mars advising over 200 early stage organizations with a specific focus on high potential clean tech ventures. Mr. Pasika earned a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Waterloo, an MBA from the Schulich School of Business and a Chartered Director designation from McMaster University. He is also a member of the faculty of the McMaster Directors College and Non-for-Profit Governance Institute where he lectures on director selection, evaluation, climate change and corporate social responsibility. Please welcome David. Thank you, Marielle. It's great. It's great to be back here at uh, Entrepreneur 101. Uh, as Marielle uh, had indicated, I've uh, spent many years down here and many years at this podium. Uh, and uh, this is actually one of my favorite lectures. I'm quite passionate about the whole governance uh, experience. And more importantly, I'd like to spend a little time with you today uh, providing you with some tools and tips that uh, as well as educating, uh, filling in some gaps, if you will, we hope will provo provoke some thinking and provide you with the tools that you'll be able to take back uh, to your organization, whether that be the early stage startup, uh, the TSX venture company, or the TSX main, uh, main company. Um, what I'm gonna do here tonight uh, is uh, I'm gonna sort of break it into a couple of different parts. Uh, there's a lot of material to cover in about 45 minutes, so I, and I wanted to give everyone a good overview of the, of the issues. So we usually start out with what's the problem all about, and so we'll talk a little bit about a problem. We'll talk about the relationships between boards and advisory boards and what those differences look like, what the differences look like today and over a period of time as your company begins to grow. And then more importantly, how do you build that dream team board or group of advisors? Uh, and then how do you get the most out of them? So uh, it's a fairly full agenda, if you will, uh, from uh, that perspective. First up is uh, one of my favorite uh, um, uh, slides, which is really kind of listing out a number of the governance failures that we've seen over the last couple of years. You know, you go back to 2002, the first uh, couple there, Enron and, and WorldCom were probably the first two that came to light very, very early. And then I'd say from there, we've picked up quite a bit of speed. Um, and clearly, uh, you know, I don't think you can pick up a paper today and find something else that's going a little sideways. These problems are both on both sides of the border and, of course, internationally uh, uh, also. Uh, more recently, I guess if I was doing the list today, I might add, uh, you know, Ceno Forest to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the group. 
uh, and, uh, and I'm sure we'll find something else before Christmas as the, uh, as the reporting period starts to, uh, to come in for the, th uh, to, for the fourth quarter in early 2012. Uh, clearly, there's a couple of Canadian icons on there, the two that, uh, you know, that uh, are, are most interesting. Nortel, of course, will go to trial next month, so I, I, I'm sure you're going to start to hear a little bit more about that. And I'm just fascinated by reading about Olympus. Uh, obviously, that's not a Canadian company, but uh, that, as that story unfolds, I think you're going to see some very interesting things in there uh, that point to failure in our governance process, uh, and it ties back to uh, the caliber and the quality of our board boards and boards of directors. Um, lots of studies have been done on that, that list of, uh, of governance failures, if you will, over time. And uh, you know, they really point to a, a number of different things that I think uh, everyone should be aware of in, in the room as you, as you think about populating your board and your advisory board. You know, first of all, uh, the first thing that sort of comes to mind is a lot of the boards are, are basically taking the management reports at face value. And of course, we all know larger than life CEOs can, can often be quite persuasive. And so as a result, uh, you know, when they, when they did the studies on some of those, the, that page two uh, list there, uh, they found that those larger than life guys were able to bamboozle the board, if you will, and, and uh, through their management reporting spin. Uh, I think another uh, systematic problem is the fact that boards uh, typically don't meet very often. A typical cycle might be four board meetings a year plus maybe one to review the annual uh, budget or strategic plan. So there might be four or five times that they're meeting. And as a result, it, it's hard for an individual to really absorb uh, all the things that are going on in the company and help uh, to uh, um, um, accentuate, if you will, the, the decision-making process of management. So that's obviously one of the things that, uh, point, that, that it points to why some boards are, more, uh, are ineffective. Um, I think the other one, and we'll talk about it later as we go into the lecture, is around board skill and experience. And this is, I think you saw the Rick presentation uh, video a couple seconds ago. That was certainly one of the tips, that surrounding yourself with the right advisors who have the right level of skill to be able to move you to the next level, yeah, absolutely critical. And then I'd say, just in conclusion on this chart, we look at the, at the last line there and basically said uh, there's, there's often a propensity for boards to be silent and not wish to rock the boat and not wish to put their hand up and dissent to a particular decision or a particular direction that management's taking. So these are things that we have to be very mindful of as we, as we uh, build out effective uh, board structures. Um, the next set of uh, charts is really just to try to show you how the governance model fits together and what those various relationships look like and how the pieces all fit together because you, you probably know about boards of directors and you've heard about advisory boards, but how do those structures uh, sync and, and link together? So first of all, it starts with the, the corporation, which is obviously a legal entity that, that, is, that is created. And this legal entity has three main players. You know, first of all, there's the shareholders, if you will, or the owners of the company. That would be in the bottom uh, right-hand uh, part of the chart. And um, then uh, they, have, uh, they appoint um, the board of directors uh, to uh, look after the organization, if you will, and represent their interests. And then finally, that, that board is actually hiring probably the key managers, specifically the, the president, and maybe have some influence on the CFO, uh, as well as some of the other senior leaders that go into the organization. And, um, and that's how those three pieces fit together. The fourth structure, which we'll talk about tonight also, is the advisory uh, role. And you see I've pointed that up uh, to the management uh, part of the triangle. And, and this is sort of why. So here are the linkages, you know, the shareholders, and you've probably seen lots of proxy statements if you have any investments in publicly traded companies. Those are starting to roll in, if you will, because uh, companies are coming through their fiscal year end. But they're, they're basically those shareholders have to vote on two things. They're voting usually on the selection of the auditors, and they're voting on a slate of directors uh, who will look after the organization. 
The directors then typically, uh, uh, one of the structures that they have available for them is to create a number of subcommittees. And typically uh, a TSX venture or a TXX, TSX uh, company typically has to have a, you know, a finance committee, an, an audit committee, uh, an HR committee, and maybe there'd be a compensation committee. But typically there's about three subcommittees that get formed. And there might be other committees that get formed ad hoc through the process. But that's a, one of the structures that the, the board has in its, in its governance process to uh, delegate certain tasks to individual committees. Then, of course, the management, we've talked about that. And then the management, uh, the president and the CFO would, of course, hire their, uh, their uh, vice president or director structure under them. But they would also then look to supplement their ma management and leadership skills with additional advisors, if you will, called the advisory board. So this is how the, the structures uh, uh, fit together. I think uh, also in that video a little earlier, John Switzer talked about the fact that the relationships change over time. And uh, I built this chart a couple of years ago, and I think it has quite a bit of relevance to, to, to show you the difference between an advisory board and a board of directors. So if you're starting up your early stage company, what you probably do is surround yourself with lots of family and friends. And you ask for lots of advice from everybody, including your uncle and your brother and your, your sister and, uh, and, and your circle of friends. And that's essentially your early stage advisory boards. You, most of you in this room don't realize it, but you do have an advisory board uh, of mentors that you're, you're calling upon. So that would be stage one. And then as your company starts to take some shape, and, and let's say you get to the first major step, which was incorporate, so you get an Ontario listed, uh, you know, numbered company, if you will. In those articles of incorporation, you have to designate a single board uh, member. And uh, so as a result, at some point over time, uh, you will now create a board of directors. It might just have one person on it, it might actually be you, uh, but uh, that's the way it starts. And you can see that um, on the left-hand side, um, uh, you know, as as uh, as the um, the influence and the governance and the complexity of your organization shifts, you can see that uh, the board of directors will take a more important role in your organization as it moves over time. Specifically, as you your stage moves from idea to uh, incorporated company to company with uh, some products and services and maybe even some uh, beta revenues if you will that that uh, that is changing over time and the and and you need to change the structure and the structure needs to look a little bit different clearly when you take on your first uh, finance money someone gives you or uh, or an angel invests in you they'll be wanting to make sure that their money is in good hands. So they'll be looking for more of a board structure than an advisory structure. So you can see over time what will happen to your early stage company. There'll be more board of directors influence and less advisory influence, but both forces can, can coexist uh, uh, with, a, with an organization. Um, just a little bit now uh, shifting gears and talking a little bit about what these directors do on a, on a, board, of, uh, on a board of directors. And there's kind of two concepts here that I think are very relevant and will help, help you understand uh, uh, what the board is facing. As, and, and more importantly, as you go to individuals and ask them to be on your board, uh, what does that actually mean? Uh, the first one is something called the fiduciary uh, duty, and, and basically, uh, this is by statute that you know that the director uh, has to act in the best interests of the corporation. And this is a Canadian uh, this is a Canadian uh, version of uh, of fiduciary duty. In the U.S., it's a little bit different. It actually talks about um, looking at the best interests of the shareholder. And uh, why is that different? Well, let's look at um, what a corporation looks like, a corporation uh, actually has a number of different stakeholders. And so um, it's not just shareholders uh, that Canadian directors have to look after. They have to look after the broad spectrum of our, of our stakeholders here, which means you know, the legislators, the regulators, uh, maybe the banks, the, the financial covenants associated with the money. So there's a number of different positions that a Canadian uh, board of director uh, has, to, uh, has to consider as they make, um, as they make their decisions and choices. 
Um, the other thing, uh, the other duty that the director has is something called a duty of care, and you can read the words there, but it's, it's really to exercise care and diligence and skill that anyone in similar, faced with similar information would make the same kind of choices. And so the law says that the, the, the board of directors uh, don't have, you know, they don't have to always get the decisions right, but given the facts that they have to make the decisions, they have to do something that someone else uh, would do in, in similar situations. So those are two very critical uh, director duties um, that, that have to be performed. Um, specifically then, what kind of functions do the, do the directors look after? Well, there's really only three, believe it or not. And uh, it, I always found it fascinating that, you know, as an early stage CEO, I would get my board, uh, I would surround myself with my board, and then the first thing I found out was that they could actually eliminate me after I put them into office. So, so uh, you know, clearly hiring and firing is one of the first things uh, up on the list. Um, also, uh, reviews and approves the strategic direction. Not writing the strategic uh, direction, but actually commenting and, and, and helping shape that strategic direction. And, and directors often do that through, um, through a formal process of uh, you know, signing off on the strategic plan, having a strategic retreat, and, uh, and helping management debate the issues on where we are and where we should be going. And then the third uh, uh, duty is really around monitoring the performance of the organization uh, and enhancing the decision-making capability of, of management. And that's typically done through a meeting structure, uh, you know, monthly meetings, quarterly meetings, annual meetings, a number of different things like that. And those are very, and we'll see later on, those have to be very formally uh, constructed um, uh, so, that, uh, so that the directors have the right tools in their hand to be able to do uh, their key three functions. So what, what are the tools? And I think this is an interesting chart because this will probably, especially for early stage uh, CEOs who suddenly surround themselves with a board and, uh, and, and suddenly there's a whole pile of people asking them a lot of questions. And, and why is that? Well, because to exercise that uh, fiduciary duty, the directors need information. And to, to exercise their duty of care, they need to, to, be, to satisfy themselves that they're, they're making decisions based on sound uh, input. So first up is a, is a series of information. Um, if you go to your first board meeting, you'll actually find that the directors will actually ask you to send material out to them in advance of the meeting so that they can review every page. Uh, in advance and come prepared with some questions. Uh, directors also use a lot of formal process like probing, asking, uh, digging, uh, and, and it, it'll drive, uh, if it's your first experience uh, in front of your board, it might drive you actually crazy right off the bat, uh, but they're actually just using these tools to get their, their job done. And then, of course, the last thing that they have in their toolkit is the background that they bring to the table so that they can actually make sound uh, business judgments based on the fact that they know this industry or they know some people who have been in this industry or they've got a little bit of gray hair in their head and they've actually been there and done that before. And, uh, and, and so that's where that judgment comes into place to help enhance uh, management decision uh, making. This um, I find to be one of the most fascinating uh, uh, charts uh, to talk about, and this is one as you as you surround yourself with your with your board. Uh, this is one that uh, you'll be able to hold up to your board at some point down the road, and it basically talks about sort of two ends of the spectrum, and uh, and and then more importantly, where is your company today? So at the top one, you've got a very passive board, and, and essentially they turn out to be more rubber stampers than anything else. And if you uh, read anything about Conrad Black and Hollinger, this was the case in his particular situation where he ramrodded his uh, material through the board and they often agreed to things and stamped things without actually knowing what the content was. And so obviously that's not a very good spot to be in. On the bottom, we've got the other end of the spectrum, which is the micromanagement one, you know, where um, you know, essentially the board is in the shorts uh, and, and in all the uh, nooks and crannies, and management is actually choked uh, by the, uh, the fact that the board is effectively running the company. 
and that's not a very good spot to be in it either. So best practice and governance would suggest we want to be sort of more in the middle. So if your board uh, is, is in the top, is in the very uh, passive arrangement, you've got to find a way to move uh, the bright red line, if you will, representing what management does and what board does more into the center. And if you're at the bottom, you've got to find a way to move your, uh, your, uh, your line, your bright red line up towards the middle. So best, best practice is it will depend. It, it depends on a lot of different factors, but I think this is a good rule of thumb uh, to say we don't want the two ends of the spectrum. We want to be somewhere in between. And of course, depending on the situation, you know, I got to imagine the, you know, Steve Jobs in his time, uh, you know, probably ran, you know, uh, you know, a very interesting process with his board, uh, and that was obvious. That obviously worked out fairly well for Apple. But so there, so it really does depend. Uh, uh, but uh, this is a, this is a good chart that uh, you should put into your toolkit as you think about and as you grow uh, your your board over time. Um, one thing, and I, I throw this into the, into the mix because I know a, a number of you are starting or in the process of building your, uh, your company, and I always like to think about governance as something where you want, where you want to be. And so where do you want to be? I think you want to be, you want to look and feel and run a company, even though it's very small, that, it, that has a vision of ultimately being on the Toronto Stock Exchange. That's just my, that's just my view of the situation. Maybe your goals are different. But, but I, so I like to sort of hold this out, um, and the, uh, the OSC uses a number of instruments and documents to sort of manage their, uh, the, uh, the, the companies that are listed. And this is one of their instruments called the National Instrument uh, 58101. You simply just have to Google that. It'll bring up the 50 pages, and that will, be, that will give you the guideline for what it'll look like if you were a publicly traded organization. It, that document will describe what your board should look like, who should be on, the types of things, people that should be on the, the board, specifically how many independent board members do you have, a uh, very, uh, very critical uh, uh, component. And then it'll also describe the kinds of structures and the types of processes that you need to, to put in place to manage your organization. So as I advise my uh, Mars clients here over time, I always said, let's hold this out as the vision. Here, we're, we're back here somewhere, but that's ultimately where we want to go with our board and our advisory board. So I throw that out there for reference to, to allow you to, to do a little bit of reading about what it, what it should be uh, moving forward. I think more importantly on this lecture, it's really about how do we build that board. And, uh, and I think that's what you want to hear, and you want to hear uh, you know, the, how that sort of comes together. And you can use the same concept here for the board of directors as well as your advisory board. Uh, you heard John Switzer early on in the video talking about you know, defining what the gap is. And this is, is one of the, mo the most critical things that you should do. You should sit down very critically with a piece of paper and say, here is where I am. Here is where I'm struggling, I, I, and here is the leadership that I have and the leadership that I don't have. So what roles are missing? And, and obvious, obviously early stage companies uh, don't have all the management functions in place uh, as of yet, so you might actually be missing a salesperson, or you might actually be missing that key regulatory person who will get your product approved. Uh, you might actually um, not have strong financial leadership on your team just yet. So there's another function that you want to kind of you know think about, and and of course <clears throat> you know thinking about business experience, management experience. What experience do the directors that I might be approaching to come onto my company do they have? Have they been there and done it before? Have they taken an early stage company from zero to 100 miles an hour and from 100 miles an hour down to zero again and then back up? Like these are very valuable uh, skills and experiences that will go a long way to helping shape you and, and your organization uh, moving forward. And of course, there's some personal attributes too, which we'll talk about later, which is, you know, there's got to be a little bit of chemistry uh, with the individuals. Can you actually trust them? Can, and and uh, as they provide advice, is the advice sound? Is it consistent? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think one of the key ones is obviously industry experience. And it, it fascinated me when I started to look at, say, the, the Lehman Brothers or the Goldman, uh, you know, boards. A uh, study was written up and said, if you look at Lehman Brothers, of the 10 directors that were on that board, only three of them had direct uh, industry expertise. 
And, and so you got to say, well, wait a minute, uh, you know, how can that be? What, you know, what were the other seven, you know, where did they come from and what qualifies them to help, uh, you know, shape that organization moving forward? And of course, you can see what ultimately happened with, uh, with that situation. <clears throat> um, there's a consultancy group out there called the uh, Guided Futures, and at the back of the presentation, you'll see their website. I've uh, put it in as one of my uh, uh, references here. And, and they advise boards on how, uh, how to increase their effectiveness, if you will. And um, they identified four key characteristics of those high-performing boards. And this uh, basically was a study that was done. Uh, Globe and Mail does something called the Board uh, Index or the Board uh, Report. And it just came out, uh, uh, I think it was about a month ago. And, uh, and so these guys looked at the, one, you know, the, the companies that sat at the top of the heap and did a little study on them and say, what made their board so good? And these guys basically said it comes down to about f four things. First of all, a very strong-willed uh, chair, someone who obviously has strong personality, uh, well-prepped, uh, preparation is, is critical to these things, has the tact and the business judgment to be able to make the choices and the trade-offs necessary. Um, they also thought it was important that the board spend a little time gelling as a, as a group, including gelling with the management and leadership team. And in the boards that I've sat on over my career, we, you know, we always have our annual strategic retreat. It's always off-site somewhere, and it's, and, and it's always intended to be a longer period of time so that we can interact with, uh, with our fellow board members and senior management on a, on a different kind of experience. And, and so getting in sync with what makes everyone tick around the table uh, makes a big difference so that, I, so that we can effectively throw issues onto the table, we can talk about the elephant in the corner, and we can debate, uh, and then ultimately make a choice and a decision and move on. And more importantly, have we really moved on? Can we actually check our emotional ego at the door and, and, uh, and uh, remember that we made that decision and we all voted on it, let's, and uh, let's not bring that up again kind of thing. So um, the third thing was really around making sure that management, senior management, was actually equipping the board with appropriate information, the right amount of information, the right amount of recommendations with some options and choices so that the board could actually look at the, what, was going inside, what was going on inside the management's head when they decided to go this way versus that way. And it, and it gives a, a level of detail that people then obviously can get in and, and, and debate. And then I think the last uh, characteristic, which I think is always uh, a, a good one, and it's one that I subscribe to, is let's spend more time looking out the front of the windshield as opposed to looking in the rear view mirror. So, um, you know, the boards that I'm working with today, what we effectively do is the re reviewing the results and the what happened is probably about 15% of the total meeting. We're spending more time thinking about strategic stuff and where the company should go versus where it came from. Now, obviously, if you're in trouble, you've got to dig deeper and spend more time looking at the back and, and dissecting, but it's more about moving forward. And so uh, that can effectively be done by uh, looking at your agendas and making sure that the agenda is appropriately uh, uh, balanced for forward-looking thinking as opposed to rear view. Now, why would someone want to come onto your advisory board or your board of directors? Uh, I think it's important that you understand what is motivating people. And uh, that way, I think you'd be better equipped to actually make a sales pitch to some individuals that you've already targeted that you want to be part of your organization. In some cases, it's a favor, okay? And, uh, and, and that might work okay for an early stage company. Obviously, a TSX uh, company, that's probably not as applicable. Uh, m most of those uh, board positions are done through a, an effective search. Um, but um, some, some folks uh, want to provide some give back. They think uh, helping early stage entrepreneurs get to the next level is quite charged up. Uh, no secret that, uh, you know, uh, I, I got a great thrill out of uh, man, uh, advising over 200 early stage companies. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's very rewarding work to be an entrepreneur in residence here at, uh, at the Mars Center. Um, certainly, you guys have some interesting ideas that we don't know anything about, so it's always fun to, to uh, get involved with leading edge or bleeding edge uh, technologies or ideas, and that's also a charge uh, also. 
And so there, for some of us, it might be fun. Uh, other cases, uh, one, once you get a little bit of cash in the bank, there might also be a little bit of remuneration associated with it. Uh, obviously, in early stage stuff, you're probably going to pay more in options or future considerations, if, uh, if you will. But um, one of the things that I found fascinating in, the early, in my early uh, uh, career was some people actually turned me down, and I was quite shocked and surprised that they'd actually turned me down. Well, why would they do that? Well, because there is actually inherent risk in being on the board of, a, of, an, of an organization. And, and the board risk uh, comes up, uh, it could come up in, in a joint and several basis, which means that an individual director or all the directors as a collection could actually be sued under certain, con under certain conditions and have to reach into their pocket and pay out. And these are just a couple of examples, especially as a company's moving into insolvency. You know, there are, there are fees that need to be paid out, or there's um, uh, 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 money that needs to be paid out to employees, uh, creditors, and, and the government that the board just can't get off the hook for. So there, so there is personal liability and personal risk associated with this stuff. Also, there's some personal contact stuff that could come back to, to hurt the board too, especially if, uh, uh, if they're trading, uh, if it's a publicly traded entity and they're trading on insider information. And of course, we've probably read a couple of those stories over time too. Um, and uh, so there is a big risk and, and, and so it is a commitment. So don't be surprised and shocked if someone who would be just perfect for your board uh, decides that uh, uh, they uh, are gonna take a pass. Um, how, do the, how do you defend the risk, I think, is uh, also important for you to understand. And uh, we've talked about the fiduciary duty and the duty of care, best interests of the corporation, and to, uh, and to use a prudent man test associated with the decisions that you're making. Those are defenses in a, in a legal structure that will provide some defense for the, for the board uh, members um, uh, if they've taken the right steps. Uh, to uh, look after all of the stakeholders or uh, actually ask for more information or get a, a, um, an expert advisor to advise a, on a particular issue. Um, there are also some other uh, structures associated with the corporation can indemnify the directors in certain cases. And then there's also uh, some, uh, some, uh, some uh, insurance vehicles called director and officer uh, uh, insurance, which can also provide a little bit of help uh, for a director. So it's not all lost, uh, and, uh, and, and directors do sign up for early stage companies um, in addition to uh, larger ones. Um, often in this, uh, in this hall, I get asked about the advisory roles because not everyone will go to a board structure right away. And uh, many of you might have read the book, uh, Art of the Start, uh, Guy Kawasaki, uh, uh, a venture capitalist in the Valley. Um, I think it's on the uh, Mars best reading list, uh, if I recall. Um, anyway, he, had, he came up with these uh, things. He, he said there's really five types of advisors that you might want to have on your, on your advisory board. The first one is the, the customer. So someone obviously knows the business development cycle and, and knows the products or the services and understands the key needs. Um, and, and maybe not necessarily in your industry, but certainly understands how you're ultimately going to put revenue on, on the books. Everyone needs a geek, they say. So, uh, you know, someone who can, you know, do a little reality check about the technology and make sure that uh, all those uh, technical uh, issues can come together. Uh, or in the case, if you're a software company, those early stage development stuff, you need to make sure you have a geek advisor who can help uh, the management through uh, some of the challenges associated with software development. You need sort of a father figure, if you will. Someone's got that calming influence, because uh, uh, in many cases, your hair is going to be on fire, if you will, as you, uh, as you go from zero to 100 miles an hour. Um, someone watching the, uh, the dollars and cents. Uh, it says tight ass up there, I guess. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, the Jerry Maguire type. Uh, lots of connections, lots of network. Oh, I know a guy. Oh, I know this. I can find you that. You should talk to. Uh, are kind of keywords uh, that you that you would hope that your advisor who sits in the Jerry Maguire uh, seat would be able to pull off. A um, couple things, you know, shifting gears, how do you manage your board or your advisors? And uh, this is sort of a checklist of best practices, things that you should do. 
First out of the gate is something that I would call orientation, which is making sure that they actually understand what they're getting into. You would do that uh, at the front end of the process. Uh, and then once they sign on, you might actually give them even more information, maybe all the financials, the last strategic plan, the, the one you're working on, any, any kind of material to give them a flavor for what the industry looks like, to help fill in some of the holes that they might not already have. I'm a big believer in the next item, which is, is having a charter. And a charter is essentially just a, almost like a job description on what you expect from your board and your advisors. And, and the charter that I'm looking at is like a one pager. And it basically says, here's what I expect. I expect for my uh, board uh, members uh, to attend six meetings a year. Uh, and those meetings would be, uh, we would expect 100% attendance at those. Uh, and we'd also ask for a weekend uh, retreat opportunity. So you lay that out there very clearly as to what you expect. Also lay out what, you know, not on, you know, what your performance standard looks like. If it's 90% uh, attendance or 100% attendance. And, uh, and lay out what you expect them to do to come to those meetings. And so you get fairly granular around what it is you expect them to do. And believe me, this is one of the things that will actually go a long way to uh, helping A, recruit, and then, help, and then helping you ensure that you're actually getting high value from your, from your uh, advisors or your board members. Um, meeting management, very critical. Um, don't waste my time setting up a meeting and then not sending any materials in advance. Um, I'm a busy guy. I will, if I make a commitment to the charter, I will live by the charter, I'll attend, but I want to be prepped. And how do I get prepped? I need materials in advance. So, so don't just rush on to the agenda, a whole pile of things, and ask me to make a decision on it. I'll just say, great, we'll, uh, we'll take that under advisement. Maybe we'll decide next, next week uh, or whatever. Good agendas, uh, good minutes, strong chair, all those things sort of play into, come into place. And then I'm a big uh, fan of sort of in-camera meetings where the, where the board would actually ask the management to leave the meeting so that we can talk about the effectiveness of the managers uh, as well as the effectiveness of the, of the meeting itself. Um, not all our directors are, uh, are uh, cut from the same cloth. Uh, I found this uh, 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 description of a couple of director types that you're going to run into uh, and advisor types that you'll run into over time. The first one is the guy who or the woman who likes to be on the masthead. So they are all excited and enthusiastic about joining your board, but you can never get them to show up uh, to a meeting and, uh, and you can never get them to take on any extra work or you can never seem to find them when you need to find them. And so, uh, you know, I call those masthead uh, folks. And uh, they're out there. It, it'll happen. It happens in all, on, on, on every board. There's always uh, some weaker, weaker players. Um, another characteristic is something that I call run silent and run deep. I've sat in a lot of board meetings where people have actually sat through the whole meeting four hours and not said anything. Um, and now part of that reason is because they might not have actually opened the binder uh, that had all the board materials in before the meeting started. Or uh, I've seen people show up and you know in the FedEx, when you FedEx a binder out, they put a, a nice wrapper on it and uh, it's a little tough to rip open the plastic bag. Well, I've seen board members actually rip the plastic bag open as we walked into the meeting. So how effective is their contribution out of that? Um, we also see some board members personally challenged, uh, you know, the, the rant and the rave and the pound the desk and, you know, emotionally, uh, you know, charged up. And as you know, when you throw emotions into a meeting, into, into a discussion, things go off into the ditch fairly quickly. So, so that's another one to watch out for, just the, the, the characteristics and the personality. And then the last one is uh, some, something called ethical poison. We don't see it too often, but I have seen it, where people have joined the board basically so that they can advance their own career or their own business. Uh, so they're, uh, they're doing side deals, if you will, and, and using the information uh, that they've been uh, presented with to, for personal gain. And so those are just a couple of things to sort of watch out for. Um, I guess the, uh, you know, uh, one thing that, is uh, these are a couple of telltale signs to say maybe you don't have a good advisory team. Uh, and so I thought that was useful to kind of put those up there as reminders. You know, uh, you know people coming to meetings and not prepared, don't say anything, et cetera. And I, I'd always ask the question at the end there, are you getting good 
great return from your advisors. It's a lot of effort to recruit them, and are you getting what you asked for? And that's where I think the charter uh, goes. You know, if you've got a charter and say, there's what I expect, and here's what I'm getting, you know, there's obviously, you'll have a, an, an, an opportunity for a great discussion. Uh, best practices in, uh, in wor working with your advisors is actually to put, to, uh, put together some assessment, director assessment. Uh, course directors will, uh, will, will resist this, but it's very important and it's, a, and it's a great best practice. The chair usually needs to uh, drive this agenda, if you will. But there's lots of cheap and cheerful things that you can do uh, to evaluate the performance of your directors. Uh, the first one, and you see that in a lot in the proxy statements, is simple attendance. How many meetings were there and how many people showed up? And uh, who were those people who showed up consistently and those, and those that didn't? I always like at the end of my meetings to do something for the good of the board where we go around the table and ask for some feedback on how the board meeting went. Um, you know, typically that feedback comes in two forms. It could come in a, in a verbal form where we would just say, okay, what worked, what didn't, what are the areas we need to improve, you know, and let's, let's take the emotion out of this thing. So you could just have everyone talk for a couple of minutes and, and you'll, get the, uh, you'll get the feedback fairly quickly. The chair can write it all down and, and figure out what to do at the next meeting that will make that next meeting much better. And the, the other one that's really interesting, too, is a, it's a simple survey. There's five questions on it. Just think about those five questions. Have a scale of one to five. Circle one, two, three, four. You know, high, medium, and low, whatever, whatever you like. And hand those things in anonymously to the chair at the end of the meeting. And boy, you've got some really cool uh, feedback on what it is you, you as a board need to do to, to move the uh, yardsticks. And then, of course, more sophisticated boards actually go through peer-to-peer, -peer, 360 evaluation. And in some boards, I've actually seen where we, we bring in some technology and we, we ask a question about how effective is the board and people vote electronically and we see it on the screen and then we take that off to, to debate at our strategic retreat. Um, so um, I think uh, in summary, um, what I hope that I provided here uh, today was uh, a little bit of uh, an overview of the problem situation, a little bit of an overview of you know, how the corporate and governance structures come together and how boards and, and advisory boards are part of the ecosystem that are important to early stage companies as well as mature uh, uh, publicly traded companies. I think um, I, I took great pride in also saying, here's some stuff around how to build these boards. More importantly, how do you manage these boards? And then more importantly, from a best practice perspective, how do we evaluate our, our performance? Um, I believe that these materials are available to you uh, in written form or in electronic form. So uh, these are some of the reference documents that, uh, that I that I shamelessly stole information from to supplement my own experiences. And uh, I think uh, they're quick, easy reads, and I think they're good reference guides for, uh, for anyone who's uh, out uh, starting up their, their business. And so with that, uh, I go over to uh, open mic, and I thank you for your time. I think we have a couple of mics here, and uh, we're, we're also monitoring the webcast, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing before we start the questions. If you are registered, everyone here should be registered for the course online. We do send out a weekly newsletter that you receive through Eventbrite. It comes from Mars DD. That comes out on Monday, and that usually includes a link to the previous week's lecture. And there we post the speaker slides as well as the lecture video. So you'll find that in the newsletter. If you're not receiving it, check your junk mail. Um, also, if you check the Mars. Oh, blog come on. It wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> If you check the Mars blog on Mondays, there's always an Entrepreneurship 101 blog, and that links to the slides, the video, as well as other articles and resources, some of which David mentioned tonight. Um, and also, we've also noticed that a few people are filming on their phones. There's no need to film the lecture because we do have, we have our professional studio crew here, and all of those videos are high quality, they're edited, they have all the information that you need. So please refrain from videotaping on your own equipment and check out our resources that we work really hard to make available for you. Thank you. Good. First question over here. Uh, actually, there are two. Uh, the first one has to do with finding some advisors. And this may be a question as much of, of Mars uh, as of you, in that, OK, 
Uh, I'm painfully aware of some of the gaps in my plan and that I need to have some advisors, and I have absolutely no idea where to find some of these people. Right. Is there a resource that you know or that Mars offers that helps match make people with potential advisors uh, when I really, I found certain gaps, family don't know it, friends don't know it, and these are areas that are, are, are identified gaps in what we need to do. Yep, absolutely. So I would say on the first uh, part, absolutely, uh, Mars is a terrific resource. Uh, we've got a you know, full-time uh, staff plus a, a network of volunteer advisors. I currently uh, act as a volunteer advisor under the, uh, under the Mars umbrella. Uh, and so there is a pretty w a deep and wide wealth of uh, advisors available here. I'd also suggest, too, that uh, you, know, you think about your own personal network. You think about the trade shows that you've gone to. You think about uh, any of the industry uh, um, events that you've gone to. You know, those are, are, are good sources of, uh, of resources. We also uh, suggest that there's a, sort of a, an interesting one. Um, depending on what, you're, what kind of resource you're looking for, um, often, um, if you think about fairly large corporations, I often phone up the, the vice president of HR and ask if they've got any high potential candidates that need a little bit of a rounding out, if you will. And uh, we've been successful in recruiting some board of directors that way. Uh, big corporations wanting to put people on to, uh, to the board. Uh, and, and uh, so that they can gain valuable uh, business experience or impart uh, their leadership style. I also think a good source would be uh, your accountant, uh, your lawyer. Um, I've often had some good success even going, uh, depending if you're, you know, if, you, if you're in a municipality, for example, going into the, you know, the town office, if you will. Uh, uh, usually there's an economic development organization there. Um, and then, of course, in the One Network, uh, Mars is one brand. There's a, couple, uh, there's, there's a couple other brands that sit out in the region. Uh, and uh, so if you're in Mississauga, for example, there's the Rick Center, and they all fit on, under the same umbrella. So there's a couple sources there. There's also some websites if you're looking for directors. There's a, a, a website, uh, I think it's called boardmatch.com, and basically you, uh, you put in your information that you're looking for the following, and uh, also potential board members put their information in, and there's a little bit of an electronic match there. Uh, so there's a couple of ideas. Okay. And the last one is you talk about all sorts of things about how you measure, measure the performance of board members. Yes. Uh, but when they're put there by shareholders and potential yeah. outside investors, how much control do you have over that? Yes. Um, I've seen that situation a couple of different ways. Um, and and the one, there was one uh, health board, um, healthcare board that uh, I was working with, and they had exactly that. Uh, they had the, 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 the town appointed uh, designate never showed up. And so uh, I'm a big fan of uh, facts are our friends. So through those cheap and cheerful methodologies of tracking performance uh, and, doing, and, and doing some 360 review, we could very quickly weed out the bad apples and then we simply took the situation on. We, we had the chair, for example, take that information and do one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the bad apple to see if they would um, voluntarily sort of move along. And then I've also seen a situation where we've actually gone back to the shareholder and said, here are the facts. You know, this person doesn't show up, this person doesn't whatever, you know, all fact-based and say, we'd like, a, we'd like a change out. And I've seen that, uh, and I've seen the change out happen. Sorry, I, I, guess we, I guess we alternate, right? So over to the right. Sure. Um, I just had a quick question, actually, about uh, you were talking about some of the personal liability risks that yeah. are associated with uh, recruiting yep. uh, directors. Do, do the same risks actually apply to uh, recruiting uh, advisors as well? No, not, not at all. And that's, in, in fact, one of the, uh, the advantages so, um, of, uh, of an advisory board. There's no fiduciary uh, liability associated with that. You could take their advice or not take their advice. And so a lot of, a lot of small companies or early stage companies use that fact to, to kind of do both. And you saw in my chart there, you know, you're going to have more advisors at the front end, but you do need to get a, a, a proper governance structure in place as, as you get your first stage uh, seed capital, for example. That'll be one of the requirements, and typically you'll get one of the angels sitting on your, uh, on your, uh, on your board, and they'll bring a discipline and a, and a, and a, 
in a whole style to the to the thing. So uh, and and that'll allow you to keep the existing advisors you have in the in the background as advisors to management. Great, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Hello, uh, my name is Himi Syed. I used to be on the board of a small NGO. Yep. And I experienced that they had a disease, which I called founder's DNA. Yes. <laughs> and I had to quit. Yeah. Attitudes of people change, technology comes about, demands of the market, and they would not evolve. Yes. Are there instances when you should just not have a board of directors? Well, I bet you'll find that the charter of that NGO mandates that they have to have a board of directors and they might even go as far to mandate the composition of that board of directors. So however that thing, that charity or that, or that NGO got pieced together, there's a charter, that, a statute that actually says, here's what it's gonna look like. Um, you know, I, I feel your pain and I've actually, um, uh, over my, uh, my board career in the last 10 years, I've actually come to a couple of conclusions where it's quite apparent that, uh, that uh, that the, the organization doesn't value the contribution and, and, uh, and, and I'm now running down a path of personal risk. So you did exactly the right thing to say, I've tried a couple of different things, um, you know, this is not anymore, this is not fun for me anymore, I have personal liability, life's too short, and uh, you did probably the right thing for your own personal, uh, you know, being, and, uh, and it's unfortunate, but that, the NGO is going to be, you know, the the victim in the in this process. So, does this also happen in the, I guess, the startup private sector, where you should just walk away, even though it's not an NGO, it's a business? Yeah, I think at the end, like I talked a little bit about chemistry here. You want to make sure that a, uh, it's something that you could actually add value to. It's something that you could, you know, uh, that you'd want to that you want to put some time into it. It's a lot of time to be on a on a board of directors. Uh, you know, we think that for every three hour meeting, you probably need to double the amount of time associated with the prep associated with that meeting, right? So, uh, so it, it, the hours could add up. Uh, and, and so it's, you know, so I, I think you, you know, you, you do the right thing by saying, oh, the, you know, um, uh, it's, it doesn't work for me. And conversely, the board also through evaluation should be saying, hey, I'm not getting what I need from Henry. Uh, and we think you should probably move on, Henry, you know, so it, it should cut both ways. Yes, sir. Governments like to talk the talk but not walk the talk uh, in that they want to be able to help young entrepreneurs, but quite often when it comes to any action, it's minimal at best. You mentioned about the economic development group where in sure. a municipality. Is there something equivalent with the province or the feds that could help young entrepreneurs in terms of getting their organi organization off the, off the ground from a creating of a board of directors, et cetera? Yeah. Um, I guess uh, just working with Mars, the, the, the structures that I'm familiar with are the ones that I described to you. Um, and, and of course, in the last, I guess, Entrepreneur Week, um, you, you would have seen a lot of articles written by captains of our, uh, of our industry. Obviously, the feds uh, are thinking quite significantly about that. And there are some federal programs, of course, that Mars would be familiar with as um, there are federal funds uh, put aside. You know, uh, shred credits, for example, is, a, is, a, is one thing that comes to mind that obviously uh, helps early stage technology companies. Um, so it really is, uh, you know, uh, geographic in nature, I think the one network of which Mars and, and Rick and Communitech are all part of uh, is an excellent uh, 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 provincial program, and then there are, are federal programs wrapped in there. And one quick thing, anything with the city and Mars? Um, uh, yeah, I've often, yeah, I said the town, uh, economic development, so I know Mississauga has, you know, I, I think pretty much all of the uh, municipalities and, and cities have an office uh, that uh, that might also provide some resource to you. I don't know about I don't know about cash, you know, uh, but they certainly have an office. They're trying to, you know, match um, organizations uh, with uh, with talent. You say uh, Mississauga. What about Toronto? Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't comment. Uh, Fair enough. Thank you. 
Hi. Um, I found it very interesting when you mentioned that for uh, fiduciary duty, yeah. um, in the States, they only mo mostly look at the shareholder in right. interest, but in Canada, we look at more of yep. the stakeholder. So I just wonder, in case of conflict of interest between those stakeholders, yep. like what are the general principle or any suggestions? Yeah, so I guess the case that came to light was uh, Bell Canada had an issue where uh, uh, they were obviously in a little bit of trouble a couple years ago, and they uh, and they had to kind of pull some bonds back, and um, and and it was in the best interest of the uh, of the equity holders, but it wasn't in the best interest of the bonds. And so the course the case actually went up to the Supreme Court, and and in the end, I think they ruled with with Bell because they they were able to demonstrate that the board actually looked at the equation from a couple of different angles and made the best choice, but the, but. Uh, the, the best choice with the information that they had at their at their hands. So uh, so it, it is an awkward situation. And and a couple of boards that I've been on, um, where we're running very close to the insolvency line, it, it very very tough choices that you're making. You know about um, you know people and and uh, and and layoffs and uh, and not being able to meet payroll and not being able to get CRA out there and so you you've got to look at all those factors and and that's what um, you know that's what our, our Canadian boards are all about thank you you're welcome um, I, I'm just gonna have to stop you there because we've run out of time so I'd like to say thank you David for taking the time to come out here tonight and um, for the remaining questions please feel free to come up and ask David one-on-one -on -one.